Hello, this is Diane from Diane Abroad. The show is In the Know, her podcast show. Um, I'm an international solo nomad, an author, a travel blogger, and a photographer. And I'm here to provide you writing tips, travel tips, and my views of life from savvy and thoughtful to quirky and humorous. The music that you hear, Jazz Infusion Piece, was written for me by Rafael Javadov, an incredible Russian violinist. We thank him for that music, of course. And I hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to In the Know. This is Diane, Diane Abroad, Diane Schindler coming to you from Amelia Island, Florida. I'm so excited about this episode today. It is my first effort to interview someone. I finally, I think, have the technology in place to be successful at interviewing someone. And today, I'm interviewing Dr. J. And so for those of you who don't know Dr. J, you are in for a treat. I suggest you get a pencil and paper because you're going to want to hear all about this and you're going to want you're going to want to take notes. I met Dr. J at the Story and Song bookstore here in Amelia Island and she and I just connected like there was no tomorrow. She graciously agreed to an interview. So today I want to introduce you to Dr. J. She's a PhD, a former sex therapist, former professor turned author. So you know you want those pen- that pencil and paper when I tell you her genre is erotica. Are you ready? Good afternoon, Dr. J. I'm so excited you're on this program. Hello. Well, hello, Diane. I'm excited to be on this program today. And you know, what better way to kick off your first interview than having sex be your content? And 2019, great kickoff to the brand new year. All right. So tell me a little bit about yourself. I gave you a brief introduction. Tell us more. Well, you hit the high points in terms of being a sex therapist and sex educator and moving from that life into writing. It's been an interesting uh, journey for me. And, you know, I always get asked the question, how did you decide to become a sex therapist? Well, it's not like he went and took one of those tests in the counselor's office in high school and said, oh, this is what I'm going to be. I think it picked me. I couldn't decide what I wanted to do in college, so I dropped out, and I worked for a man whose name is Phil Harvey. He had an MPH from Chapel Hill in health and education. M- what's, it, what's an MPH? A master's in public health. Mm-hmm. Okay. He was studying specifically health education, and he did his master's thesis on would people like to have sexuality information, contraception, that sort of thing, come to their home in the privacy of their home um, as as an idea. He was so overwhelmed with the results, he created a retail store that many people may know worldwide as Adam and Eve. Now there's an Adam and Eve store right here in Amelia, isn't there right off the island? Yes, and I'm not sure if it's um, affiliated with his or not. I know that he does do franchise work. And, you know, so it's that, a great place to work because they were wonderful with uh, profit sharing. Good. And so continue, continue. Then what happened? I um, finally found something that was interesting. Sexuality might be a fun thing to do. So I went back to school. I got my bachelor's degree in health education, and I got my first job working in a reproductive health center in North Carolina. And while I was there, I started a master's program. And I was so fortunate because the physician that I worked for was from Holland, and he sent me all over the world to train with all of the big names in sexuality. And that was an honor to to have that as part of what I did. And there's a lot of information about sexuality that most people don't know because in the United States, 
we don't have a way to talk about sexuality positively. Is it still a taboo subject? It's addressed negatively. And, you know, you travel, Diane, you can see that sexuality is represented in different ways in many of the countries that you've been to. But since I was working in the U.S., one of the things that I needed to have was a, a way to talk about sexuality that could connect with people. And I was using what's called a sex positive approach to sexuality. Um, we look at how we grow and learn as a process. We acquire information, we form attitudes and beliefs and values. And we do that related to our identity and our relationships as well as our intimacy. So talking about sexuality needs to be couched in a way that people feel good about who they are. And I'm one of those people who puts that message out there that we can, um, feel good about what we do, even if it's totally different from what someone else can do. Because a sex positive direction involves being comfortable with our own sexual identity while we are comfortable with other people's sexual identities. And then there was a transition from sex therapist involved in sex education to erotic writer. Tell me about that. There it was a transition and it's kind of interesting because I moved from Dr. Fleming's office in Raleigh to Florida. I taught at FSU. I taught human sexuality classes and the transition that you're referring to was retirement. Ah, but wait students. a second, you were, you were at FSU. So our audience, by the way, isn't just Floridians. What is FSU? Florida State University. Go know. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and the, so go ahead. I'm sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. And um, my students um, said, you can't retire. And I said, well, you know, actually I can. Um, they were <laughs> funny. They said, but there's nobody like you. You have to keep talking positively about sexuality and letting people know that it's okay to be who they are. And I said, uh-huh. I said, it sounds like you have a specific idea. And they said, we do. And I think it was uh, chapter five in my textbook where we talked about fantasies. And as a sex educator and therapist, there's also the research component that I work with. So I want to know what science is actually telling us. And I would have the students read that chapter. And then their homework assignment was to write a fantasy anonymously. The only thing that they could put on it was a symbol for a man or symbol for a woman. And we would get in groups in class and divide up the papers, read them and see if they matched what the research was. And the students told me that I was so good at accepting what the fantasies were and how I talked about them and made people feel that I needed to continue doing this. And I said, and yes, I'm doing this how? And they said, you're going to write erotica. All right. Well, now let me go back to something because what I'm hearing you say is when the students wrote their ran, uh, fantasies and they were all anonymous and they came in and switched them around and people read other people's out loud, they read them out loud. Is that, pro is that right? Oh, yes, they did. So they read them out loud and then you talked about the research. But what they were getting at, I assume, is that you made, you valued every single piece of written work that came in there. Everything was good. There was no um, judgment about that's their correct. fantasies. And, and, I think and so you made them feel totally comfortable. And that's what I think I'm hearing from your students, a la you, um, about <laughs> yeah. why, why it, they said you can't stop. You have to continue to do this because you had that, you made them feel successful in their approach, right? I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, the part that I haven't talked about is in that whole world for people to understand that, yes, you can be upbeat, positive and give permission, but you also have to understand boundaries. You have to appreciate other people where their bodies stop and start. And there's a consent process in all sexuality uh, components. And from a sexual health direction, you're the captain of your ship. So you need to be paying attention to what you can do to take care of yourself 
from a contraception standpoint when having a pregnancy is right for you, or um, even looking at how to protect yourself using safer sex ideas, whether you're using uh, condoms or uh, dental dams, which are uh, pla um, which are rubber material that you put over a body part and then put your mouth on it. These are things that you do to protect yourself in the world of sexuality. And we don't do a good enough job in the United States of talking about that. Mm -hmm. Good. So the boundaries are not only for um, healthy sex with regard to disease. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. As well as as well as personal boundaries that that people are comfortable with about these fantasies, for example, or these experiences. What I I, for example, would be comfortable with, um, and those are my boundaries, and I need to practice those as well. Yes, and I'm also talking about sexual assault boundaries that you just don't, you know, work with someone and ignore things that you are doing. You give consent you accept consent. So you're working together in communication about that process. And if someone says, I want to do this and you don't want to, then they need to accept that as clarity uh, for how things are done. But I think what the students were getting to is that in my class, there was, there was a acronym that I used. It was P-L-I-S-S-I-T. And that stood, it's called PLICIT. It stood for permission, limited information, specific suggestion, and intensive therapy. And as a sex educator in the classroom, I was able to use the first three. I set the environment of permission, like hopefully I'm doing today. When people are listening to me talk, I'm someone you can ask questions to. I'll talk about the information. The LI implicit is limited information. So if there's a specific topic that you want to talk about, I can help you dispel myths or misinformation and provide you with what the accurate and factual information is about the sexuality topic that's of interest to you. And then perhaps what I do is specific suggestion. Maybe you need to read this book. Maybe you need to go talk to this person. Maybe you need to investigate this particular toy, something that's of interest to you. But the IT part was the intensive therapy. If you needed more specialized private time to talk with a therapist, then that's where you would go. And that did not in, happen in the classroom. That's your approach uh, with regard to your profession as a sex therapist, P-L-I-S-S-I-T, the helpful yeah. way to think of sexuality from your perspective, from your learning experience and from your mm -hmm. education. Now, let me, um, I know we created an outline for this conversation and I probably took you away from the outline. Let's go back. And um, because one of the things that you wanted me to ask you was what was, and I want to know this too, what was your biggest aha learning moment? Oh, well, we just talked about it because my Excellent. aha was what is sex positive and how do you put that into the plicit model? Because I if see. you are grow up in well, for me, the South and in the United States, you don't even know that there's a, another way to approach sexuality or to think about sexuality. And for me to be given a, an idea of sex can be positive versus negative, and then a method using permission and limited information and specific suggestion and then intensive therapy as a way to help other people come into their own, their sexual identity, feeling good about who they are, the intimacy, the relationship pieces. That was the big aha moment for me. Well, th I, I appreciate your willingness to backtrack for that. I'm, now I'm even more clear about P-L-I-S-S-I-T. How did you transition from therapist to writer? I mean, I know your students said to you, you can't stop, you're retiring, you have to do this. So how did you actually make that transition from therapist to writer? Well, Diane, I think you more than anybody understand and appreciate that research, investigation, find out how to do things is, is the way to go. I had moved to Amelia Island and I was with a writing group 
and I was telling them what I was interested in doing and they suggested an online location uh, for classes. And I looked this up and I found a course that was gonna be offered called Between the Sheets and it was all about how to write erotica. It was between a, it was called Between the Sheets. Between the Sheets, yeah. Well, that's a good title. Go ahead. It is. And this was editor Rachel Kramer Bustle. And I worked with her for six weeks. And at the end of the class, our task was to find a call for submission. That is finding a publisher who's creating a work and they are looking for authors to contribute. And they give you specific details about what they want the story to be like, how many words long, what's the topic, that sort of thing. And I picked one out as my practice and then we had to submit it. So you write the story and then you go through the actual process like you were gonna be an author tomorrow. And it was intimidating, but it was one of the coolest things ever in that process. And, and the neat thing is that within taking the class, I found out that Rachel Kramer Russell was gonna be in Savannah. And I got in the car and drove up to Savannah so that I could meet her and go, this is real, this is me. And, and that was um, a really nice part to add into the, the process of learning about this. And I haven't left the sex research piece and um, I still look at what research has to say about sexual activity. And I've just returned from Austin, Texas where I met with Dr. Justin Lee Miller who was doing a presentation on his latest sexual research. He has a book called Tell Me What You Want. And this book is all about sexual fantasies. And as a new erotica writer, I was all excited to think about, let's see what people in the United States are focusing on for their sexual fantasies as a way to tailor specific stories that I wanted to write. Well, you know what I love about you besides everything, Dr. J. <laughs> I love when, you know, I'm, I'm an educator too. The, I'm not into sex therapy, of course, but um, my background is higher education. So learning is a part of my DNA, as is yours. So I love this notion of your taking your experiences, your education, your experiences in the classroom, and your therapy experience and and writing erotica. So you come with such a great background. I mean, I don't know if we could do a poll nationally or internationally about the erotica writers and find out a little bit about that background to see how many were former, or excuse me, how many are former sex therapists who are now doing erotica. So I'm not sure and that I, you're going to find um, a lot of people in that direction. And I think one of the things that makes me different in what I'm doing is that the students pointed out, you'll still be doing the things that you did in the classroom. And they're very true about that because when there isn't education for people to get in a classroom that's comprehensive and provides exactly what they need, people turn to porn, people turn to writing material and the people writing the stories or making the porn may not be thinking about their work in the most sex positive, uh, comprehensive sexuality life. And I look at things from the point of view of how can I continue to provide accurate information, show I'm accepting of what's going on, uh, look at what people are actually doing with sexuality and put that out in a different way. And, and when I've you say put that out, out in a, and when you say I'm interrupting you, but I'm the leader of this conversation. <laughs> so when, when you say, you know, put that out, you're talking about the pieces that you write. So you're going to yeah. put that written word, those erotica stories or articles out in a different way. Go ahead. I just want to make yeah, I'll give clear you an on example, that. Because when E.L. James work came out, Fifty Shades of Grey, um, a lot of the community in, um, in sexuality felt like it wasn't an honest and accurate portrayal of the type of relationship that the, the um, protagonist and antagonist had in the story. 
And when you take a look at that, one of the things that I'm doing is correcting that and um, making sure that the work I'm putting forward has the accurate and correct information so that somebody's not going to try to do something that was in the book and inadvertently hurt themselves. So I'm putting myself to a higher standard in what it is that I'm choosing to put forward. And it's kind of interesting to think about it in the writing world because I've had people to ask me specifically, will you help me write sex scenes? Will you help me do this? And I'm I did that. I going, asked you. I yeah, asked you yeah. that. And what, you said no. I know about writing sex <laughs> scenes? You know, it's like, oh yeah, well, I guess I'm I'm doing that. So, you know, here's my take on it, which is probably a lot more detailed and in depth than most people. I've done a little a little poll with some of the authors that I'm around and um, I asked them, tell me how you write sex scenes. And they, one, one person said, oh, well, I just write my whole story and then I leave a big blank spot that says, put sex here. And I think <laughs> that was absolutely like people's lives in the United States. We don't think about how do we integrate sexuality and sensuality and pleasure uh, all the way through the story, the character from the beginning to the end. It's okay, we're just going to put sex in this one place. And that's not how I see it at all. And, you know, I think because I've learned a lot from you and yet I know that, you know, when you learn something from someone often, you know, then what you don't know. <laughs> so as much as I've learned from you, it just makes me understand how much more I need to learn. So you asked me about my book and if I had sex scenes in the book and I said I did and you said, okay, well, tell me about them. What was the motivation for the sex scenes? And I did have motivation for the sex scenes, but it was not, I mean, I just didn't write the sex scenes for the sake of the sex scenes. There was, it was a reflection of character, but still my approach to that now having talked to you was limited because I wasn't thinking about sexuality so much when I had my characters involved in a sexual experience. I was thinking about the character and that's, I hope that makes sense. So there was a big gap. I think now I have to rewrite my book. Thank you very much, Dr. J. But um, oh, yeah, I understand. Yeah. So I've learned a lot from that. I'm so excited about your approach and because it's didactic you know it's about the learning process not only sex therapy sex positive um stories but also it's you're you're a leader in in your genre uh, and i'm so excited about that well, you wanted to say something with those words and i guess i'm going to find out what that's going to look like because i've been asked to do the presentation specifically on how to write sex scenes. And I think what I need to do is have a nice little book that goes right along with that. So I've just made my life very interesting in writing a new book. I know. I love it. Well, listen, before we, before we end this interview, I want to sort of key in on a few um, items and key in a few points of interest for our listeners um, so I will ask you to tell me and, uh, you know, where we can find you. And I know you're in a lot of places where, you're, where you are on social media. And I will be sure to put this information in the program notes as well, in the episode notes as well. So those of you who have your pencil and paper and we can't seem to get it down fast enough, don't worry, because we'll get it. So tell me, Dr. J, okay. where can we find your work? Well, you can definitely go to Amazon and find my work there. I have a Dr. J Amazon author page, and you can see all the books um, that I have stories in there. And um, I do I do want to tell you one thing, though, in terms of um, an accolade that occurred that I didn't expect to happen in the process of writing. I ended up having a story submitted and accepted with Best Women's Erotica of the Year by Cleus Press. And I submitted that story for a literary 
fiction competition and ended up with a semi-finalist award. And it was not an award that related to erotica. I was up against all short story fiction. So that's a, a pretty good thing that, that I can feel good about in terms of doing this. I have some new books that are going to be coming out in the spring. Again, those will all be on Amazon. I do a lot of blog writing on my website, drjauthor.com, and you can see little serials that I do there. If you're um, international, you probably know more about using apps on your phone, and there's a specific app called Radish Fiction, and I'm um, one of their authors, too. So I think those are the places that you can find my work. But you're, but you have also presented um, about social media platform, social media platform for authors. You're becoming well known as an expert in that field as well. I'm learning from you about that. And so, um, will you? Well, you know, the you be- easiest place for people to find my social uh, media is going to be to go to my web page because I have every single one of them. I'm on Twitter. Um, Pinterest, Instagram, Google Plus, um, Goodreads, Book Club, all of those things. So people can find me uh, most easily at the website. Fantastic. All right. Look what we've done. Look what we've done. I love in, a, in, in 30 minutes or less. So we have found out about your background, about your experiences and how you got actually into the sex therapy business. And then how you as a sex educator became erotica writer and your perspective on teaching sexuality in the classroom, which now is transitioning into the writer and your writer as an erotica writer, your works as an erotica writer is going to incorporate and has incorporated sex positive sex scenes, right? Is that how to say that? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm honored. I am honored. I'm delighted that you had me come in today. You know what? We're going to finish this up with my favorite music. 